Hello there, Sarah from 17 once again. This is my Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep Critical Difficulty Walkthrough. We're playing as Aqua and we're in Neverland. So Neverland is where Aqua's campaign really kicks up a gear and teaches you how to play. And that might sound like a pretty novel concept considering we've been playing, what, 15 missions before this, give or take, like, uh, including bosses. So it, it's, it's quite a statement, but it's true. So far, you could have been very successful by just banging on the game and not really learning anything, not really needing to know anything to progress. Whereas, when you come here, you definitely do. Because not only are you going to be going up against Vanitas, who is a boss who will destroy you gladly, but there's also a lot of enemies that do pretty high damage, and depending on how strong your aqua is at this point will depend on how well you can deal with them. I get a lot of comments on my Kingdom Hearts videos, about people saying like, how come I don't take as much damage as they do? How come I've got more life than they do? How come I'm doing more damage than they do? And, and things such as that. And the thing to bear in mind here guys is, you can get equipment in these games and you can level up in these games. Depending on those variables will depend on your variables. And if they differ to mine, it probably means that our setups are different. In Kingdom Hearts 2, I expressed all the way through the walkthrough that I was going to be doing armor and gear off screen. So I was constantly wearing the best protective armor that entire playthrough. So if I was having, you know, less damage, that's why. And it wasn't a playthrough; it was a walkthrough. But you know what I mean. But these guys here, these uh, these monkeys that have the technically apes, I think, that have the the banana on their head, they have this wonderful ability to do massive damage on any of the moves if you let them do it. But the good news here is you can be so aggressive with your attacks that they don't have an opportunity to, to really do anything. And that helps, because if you have an enemy who doesn't have frame advantage, but when he does attack is incredibly dangerous, you need to stop that from happening. And bringing this back to Yakuza, because I've been playing a lot of it recently, Yakuza is a game that is full of enemies like that. They don't attack that frequently, but when they do, they do some good damage. And the way that this is different to, to Yakuza is they give everybody armor on that game, and it means that you cannot stop them attacking. And uh, once again, it's, it's an interesting choice, isn't it? And you'll differ whether or not you think that that's better or worse. Because if you look at a game such as this, you can kill everything without them attacking. If you're aggressive enough and if you've got the right tools. I love that. I think that's how a game should be. That being said, I wouldn't want every enemy not to be able to attack. I would like to have certain enemies, you know, be maybe faster than me or have certain attacks that you know, I cannot stop unless I do something very specific. Whereas in Yakuza, every move uh, is very difficult to stop it's off certain enemies, and the, it's a game that constantly changes its rules, which I find to be quite confusing, because I'm not 100% sure on what's going to happen. As We build up a lot of styles here, and you notice how I'm not doing as much damage either, and they're doing a lot more damage to me, as I've just been poisoned. It's a tricky area, this, purely because I'm not... Uh, quite as tough as I could be for being here and everybody is taking a little bit longer than I'm used to them taking which is why I'm building up so many styles and it's also why you see me using the dynamic link which I never used to attack I always used to get a cheeky heal when I need it and you might wonder why I don't use a dynamic heal oh the dynamic link sorry outside of healing purposes it's mainly because a lot of the results that you get I don't find to be too interesting I cannot deny their effectiveness because they are really good moves but just I like the combat of Birth by Sleep when I'm playing as the characters and when you bring in those uh, exterior elements I don't find it to be quite as interesting. But I, I do hope they retain some of this in Kingdom Hearts 3 because I think it's the best combat system Kingdom Hearts has had. I just wish they could kind of add it to what Kingdom Hearts 2 did well and come together and, and make something truly beautiful. Because all I want is, is extra depth and extra complexity. That is literally all I would like from, from Kingdom Hearts 3. To give the player more control and more choice. And I'm almost certain that they're going to come through. It might not be in the way that I want, you know, personally. But it'll be in a way that I think we'll have a lot of fun with and we'll be able to enjoy. Is, did I go the wrong way then? I put the pots to sleep. I ignite one of them. There's the mind shield. D-Link Magnet. So, you might wonder what, what motivates the choice for some of the moves I'm using. 
Of course, AoEs is always a good choice. If you have moves that can hit a group, that is your best best choice in, in any battle, really. Unless it's a one-on-one, -on -one, and then you can get a little bit more experimental. Surges are great for giving you invulnerability frames and damaging enemies who are tough to damage. The mind shields and the mind attacks are great for situations where you need to either lay traps or you don't have great openings so then you can let the enemy hang themselves. But for the most, like right now, all I'm going to be doing is putting on spells that I want to level up. And this is a threefold process. The first is of course it empowers your character to have more choice. The second is it plays into the economy of the game where you can sell them to get currency to buy different things and then the third one of course is you can put them into creating new spells and better spells uh, as long as you know the ingredients to do so and the way to do that which can also then you know counteract in making your character stronger because you can add those bonuses when you when you generate a new spell from two previous ones which give you passives which then power up your character and give you things like critical hits you know more HP that kind of stuff which is incredibly powerful and you're looking at a character that is nowhere near close to, to mid-max or anything like that it's just this is oh there we go get eaten by the the mimic chest wonderful as I kill these enemies and I think I might be trying to level some stuff up because I'm quite concerned at this point at the damage that I'm not doing like, you've never seen me do this little damage to enemies in the game so far, which tells you that there's been a considerable step up. But don't worry, it can still be overcome with skill, because you can beat this entire game on level 1, should you choose to. And of course, there are ways to farm on level 1 and make the game easier, but you don't need to, and I think that's important, as I uh, skip that enemy, because it's very dangerous. But the boss coming up is susceptible to... Mind Shield, of course. Ignite is a really good one against him. Poison can be a really good one against him. And the Magnet and the Zero Gravity ones can also be good against him. But the thing to bear in mind is both Magnet and Zero Gravity have a tendency to miss. If they prop him up, you can respond in any way you want. If they don't, they're a waste at that moment. But it's, it's always worth trying. The reason why Poison and Ignite work so well against Vanitas is because it's passive damage that doesn't, guarantee, that doesn't rely on having to hit him. This is a boss that loves to dodge. It is a boss that will get out of the way of most things and Ignite and Poison are, are great in their way because you don't have to land that hit, they'll do it for you. As I use the Aerial Slam there, which is a move that I don't really like, and of course it fails. <laughs> because of the detection on that final hit, it can be a little fiddly. A bit more leveling up as we push forward, doing a little bit of platforming here. It's the type of stuff that Kingdom Hearts 2 really needed, but they took it out because people complained about the first game. And let's be fair with that, folks. The first game had some shitty platforming, but not all of it was shit. Some of it was okay, and they could have just got rid of the shit and kept the okay stuff. That is an incredibly good move, by the way. Time Splicer. You never used it? Mad powerful. Really good against Hook. And there's a handful of other bosses as well that you can use it to a great effect against. Any of the truly powerful ones probably doesn't work on them, but the ones who are susceptible, you can essentially stunlock them till death with that move. Really, really good to experiment with. And if you're playing this game, I hope you are experimenting, because there's so much choice. It's, it's a great game. Like, watching it now makes me want to play it. And I've got a ton of shit I should be playing. It's hilarious. The other day I, uh, I had Aiden over, and I was showing him some new games and what have you on, on the systems. And I put in Rise of the Tomb Raider for the first time, played the opening of that game, and it's a really slow opening. And I really should be playing that game, but once again I'm doing things like this, and I'm playing Yakuza. Now I've got a splitter to record Yakuza, which I'm going to be doing today. And all the other stuff, like there's some things I need to do on Bloodborne, there's, I still need to do the DLC on The Witcher 3. It's insane. Yet you sit, don't you, watching a video such as this, and you're like, I kind of want to play Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. It's just how it works. And that's one of the, the great things about YouTube, I think, when you do watch a channel that does a lot of different games. They can make you want to play a game. And it might be a game that you've used to like, or you don't like, or you've never heard of. But watching somebody play can, can be an intoxicating thing, because they can make it look, a lot of the times, more fun than it is. 
and it doesn't even have to be good gameplay it's just you know like when you watch somebody and they have a different experience to you and you're like wow that looks fun I want to do that and then you go on and you generally have a different experience like look at the damage I just did to that fucking thing that is depressing yeah but Aqua is not the physical guy you want to be using magic with her anyway but this is really dangerous just because these enemies are going to do big damage to me and I'm not doing big damage to them. Oh, this is Time Splicer, by the way. Freezes enemies and enables you to combo them. Look at it. It is glorious. Absolutely delicious. But yeah, these dudes, wow, taking a beating. <laughs> it is noticeable, but not too much so. Oh, wow, Diamond Dust. Now we can continue onwards. I'm probably gonna... Wow, look at the damage that just did. Ooh! Ow! Little shit. Great things about little shits is they float. So you can just pop them up with anything that gets them into the air. Be careful when you land, because you know that that ape guy is going to be doing something crazy. And if he touches me, I'm dead. Straight up. If he decides to do his moves, and they touch me, whew, not a good day. And for the most, I think the checkpoints are okay in this game. I think it's just from the last population you went from, when you went from one instance to another. So I don't think it'll be too bad, but... You know, the one time that you rely on it is the one time it screws you. It's one of the things I'm kind of concerned about with, with Yakuza. I'm going to be doing an EX hard walkthrough for that game, Yakuza 5. And on that, it takes away the retry option, and puts you back to your last save. And saving in Yakuza is kind of awkward. It's, it's one of those things about that game, it's, it seems to have retained a lot of the archaic, almost draconian notions of game design from a very long time ago, like the, I think Yakuza 2 came out in 2005, and Yakuza 5 came out in 2013, and it shares almost exclusively 100% of the old bullshit that was in that second game, and there's a lot of people that appreciate this because it's kind of like nostalgic, but I'm, I'm, I'm the person who's like, keep the jank, keep the charm, but get rid of the fucking crap, you know, get rid of the fluff. I don't want to have to order individual meals from a restaurant, like, it's stupid, you know. I don't want to have an inventory in, an, in a Grand Theft Auto-esque sandbox game, it's redundant. And then when I have a full inventory, I can't even go in a shop because I have a full inventory, like, really weird, janky bullshit that's very confusing. And it's getting better, don't get me wrong. Yakuza 5 is, is head and shoulders above the older ones. Like, the older ones don't even show you where the fucking side quests are. You have to just find them. And as much as I appreciate that, because I came from an era of gaming where that was what games were, Yakuza 5 did a wonderful thing where once you discovered the side quest, it pointed you in the right direction. Whereas Yakuza 3, nothing. Absolutely nothing. So you're just running around like a headless chicken wondering if you're talking to someone important. It's such a contrast. But... They are great games, folks, and if you've not touched them, you need to try them. You might hate them, but just at least say you've given them a try. Uh, that's what I did, and I ended up really, really falling for the games. And I managed to pick up Yakuza 3 for like 4 quid, and Yakuza uh, 4 for 5 quid, so I was laughing. But we just moved towards the boss now, but you'll see that in the next video. Thank you very much for watching, guys, and as always, you take care now.